We're here at Grayoville talking with Trina Paulus, the uh, artist who has uh, come here from New Jersey and come back to Gray Grayoville. She uh, has done some beautiful uh, statues, and it's Advent. She's going to tell us about Advent, and uh, we're going to walk down to one of her most elegant statues, I think. So, Trina, would you like to come along? <laughs> okay. Um, as we're walking, as we're walking toward the statue, um, would you tell us, you're here to explain about Advent, and this statue is particularly uh, meaningful with Advent, with the Advent season, so could you just explain about uh, the statue and the season? Well, this... I, I guess I start back when I first came to Grailville. That's 1949. That's a long time ago. Um, I came in October, and then and Advent was very soon. And Advent meant the coming. That's what the word means. But it was a season of darkness where in this climate it corresponds totally with the church's year of waiting, expectation for the fullness of, of what Jesus Christ is meant to be. This, this com completion of the world, this, this last period of time that we're in, that we're in the whole period of time is Advent, actually. And Advent is meant to be those four weeks preceding Christmas, which is not just the birth of Jesus, but the fuller, fuller coming of God into our hearts and the fuller coming of God into the world, and that's what, that's what we experienced at Grailville because our whole rhythm was based on the liturgical year, the church's year. So the quiet, the darkness, me coming out of 12 years of school, doing laundry and being up in the dark, and it was a magnificent change for me, for my life in Cleveland as a high school girl, but wonderful. I felt I was living the Cathedral of Chartres. Our living circumstances were extremely simple and sometimes primitive, but our cultural experience was a high art form. It was magnificent. We made songs. We sang all the time. We sang the Mass and Gregorian chant, which is a magnificent experience to have. And this is a, for a layperson, lay because at that time, it was the only place that there was. It made it's amazing to be able to come and not be a nun and not be preparing to be a nun, but be preparing to be out in the world, but wanting a deep experience of spiritual formation. So that's what they gave us. So this statue comes years and years later, decades later, when I'm living in Montclair, New Jersey, where I'm living now, and I'm still there, very disturbed that this great period of preparation, which is like what the world needs and the world is in right now, preparation for what we don't know yet, the unexpected, the, un, the pregnant time. And I thought, I wanted to do something for my front porch. This is a statue for my front porch. It never has been on my front porch, but it's, but it's a statue for it that I could put up in the beginning of Advent, right after Thanksgiving, like everybody else does, and I felt so awful with all the Christmas things up all the time, but I could put lights around her on this protected roofed over front porch that I have and it could be seen from the street and it needs to be large enough and so we have a pregnant Mary here a little pregnant Mary then at Christmas time we have a baby with swaddling clothes and then for Epiphany I also have one that stands in her lap with the arms out the the, the image what, what these images are meant to be for people who have trouble with Catholic images is that these things are just to remind us of the great mysteries. They're not to be worshipped in themselves. They're just to say, okay, we as human beings are meant to be surrendered to God, to the, to the will of God as it manifests in our lives. So that's what this statue is meant to say. And this could be Mary, it could be you, it could be me, it could be anybody. These are for men and women are meant to be. But Mary exemplified it for us. She said yes. She said yes to the impossible, <laughs> which really did seem pretty impossible, that the spirit would come upon her and that she would become pregnant and that she would become the mother of God. <clears throat> so that's, 
That's the mystery. So this is trying to catch the spirit of that yes, of that surrender. And a lot of my other things that were inspired by that first advent try to do the same thing. It's not the only thing I do, but it it's cer certainly was the prominent thing that happened that first advent at Grailville. And I feel so privileged in the middle of the 20th century to have had that experience. And I still live from it now that I'm 80. So there I am. Great. Um, when I think of Advent, I think of uh, just a time when we're rushing around, we're buying presents, we're wrapping in yeah. things. And so um, if you were to talk about Advent right now in the 21st century, and we've, you know, we've got iPads, we've got, you know, all the all kinds of technology you could ever ever imagine, and it's going even greater. Why, why do we need to wait? And what what does what does it mean to rejoice, rejoice, Israel? Your Emmanuel is coming to you. What does that mean? Well, Israel, when we talk about it, there is. It's meant to be a bigger picture. It's not meant to be the state of Israel at all. It's not meant to be the Jewish people. We, we as Christians see that everybody is called. Everybody is called. And we are all to be the chosen people. We are all chosen by God to say yes. And if we say yes, we're part of that community. Now, I don't want to define who says yes. Okay, who says yes? Only God really knows who says yes in their hearts. I'm a practicing Catholic, and I, I still do all these things. So in this 20th century right now, <clears throat> have you ever heard of Tehar de Shadan? He's a great, uh, he, died of, he died about 55 years ago, and he died in obscurity in New York City. He was French, he did work in, in uh, China, he did work in South Africa, and he wrote the book, The Phenomenon of Man, now a politically correctly titled Human Phenomena in this latest edition. But he also wrote The Divine Milieu. He was a French Jesuit paleontologist, and he had this tremendous mystic sense of the glory of creation and how all of life is moving toward the omega point. And so we are in the time of that. So in our time, maybe it's the Occupy Wall Street movement right now that is searching for a different interpretation that gets away from greed and a totally materialistic sense of that having more will get us someplace. So this goes toward Advent is meant, Advent can be the whole of time in that sense. So Advent is still this great season. Now, why I did this is because I think we need to restore Advent. All of us are so busy and hustled, and these were four weeks that we could do, and that's what Grailville gave me, that at Christmas you begin. Christmas was chosen. We don't know when Jesus was born, but it was chosen to be around the time of the solstice. That means the light in the deep darkness of winter will start to grow again and hope that light stands for will grow again and we know that spring will come and new life will come that's that's what advent is was a, was meant to be the quiet that prepares so i i also don't am caught in this other stuff but um if you see christmas in as the beginning and then you have 12 days so 12 nights that's what what's 12th night was about the feast of the epiphany when the whole mystery comes out to the world, and here at Grover we had red for Christmas, and then by Epiphany, man, everything changed to gold, and then we have those Sundays after Epiphany. Now, even in the church, that's, that's diminished and changed. But Epiphany was not just three kings. The Epiphany was that this mystery of light and life, thy light shall shine upon you. The whole reading from Isaiah, uh, that... It was the magnificence and the sort of triumph. And then we had those weeks. And then in the church year, which was what our organizational aspect was at Grailville, everything was based on that, we then go into Lent and Easter. And Lent and Easter were the mysteries of death, giving birth to resurrection. Now my email is composgal 
That's my email address. The compost for me is when you put organic matter together and the whole organic transformation. So then you wonder where is left death and life anyhow? There's oh, something looks like it's dying, but immediately if it's handled correctly and not put in the landfill or burned, it starts to deteriorate and rot in such a way that it becomes a blessing then for the new generation of life. So we have the death and resurrection thing that is part of nature. And so that's what we celebrated through Lent and Easter here at Grailville. Then Pentecost is the great triumph. And then the whole harvest feast of the Assumption and all saints. This was our life. OK, that's. OK, great. Um, could we uh, walk over to uh, the crèche? Cause, yeah, because okay. I'd like to uh, ask a few questions. All righty, here we go. Um, this is a lovely room. It has so much light. I want to know, it, as I'm standing here, it looks like the Buddha is sitting here. Tell That's me right. about th that. But I, as I read your um, uh, a paragraph that you wrote about the Magi, yes. I realized it wasn't the Three Kings. So would you like no. to talk about that? Well, we did an art production program here at Grailville when the idea was is to get better art out available for ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So it's a small one that, that we first did. And we did the, the 10 pieces, these pieces here that you can see. And everything, everybody has a gift. And Mary can sit waiting all during Advent. This Advent, we talked about the emptiness, the waiting, the expectation. Then at Christmas time, the child can bring it in. Now, this is the large set that we made for churches and larger groups. Most, this is not really a family scale thing. And uh, this little boy has the bird. So then the next year, Dr. Van Kersbergen, who founded Grailville in 1944, we need kings. And I had a dreadful time to try to imagine that with this simple sort of humble approach, how we put goldy kings in and stuff like that. OK. I finally surrendered and went to those, that, those readings that we have for Epiphany. All the nations shall come. They shall understand. And the wisdom of all the ages. And I thought, ah, those, those traditional gifts we have, they, they fit these different cultures. OK. Here we have an African, and I think of the African people with their tremendous sense of, of oneness with the earth and the, the riches of the world and the riches of the earth. So here we have the African. And I think of the Arab and the Muslim countries with their tremendous gifts of prayer. I worked in Egypt. I was there with a mosque right across the street, and five times a day you have the call to prayer, this magnificent call to prayer. These people pray. And that's what incense is mainly to represent. And then I heard the story from Lowell Thomas and his story about the Dalai Lama, about how they chose that baby. They chose it with a star, and then they went and they brought gifts. And if, if it was the right baby, it reached out to the, to the belongings of the Dalai Lama. And there's a beautiful movie called Kundun about this whole thing of the Dalai Lama and the choice of the baby. That's truly beautiful. Well, I thought, that's Myrrh, the, the abdication, the, the penitential life. And this is the begging bowl of this uh, <clears throat> monk. So we have the gifts of the world being brought to the fullness that we hope that God will bring to this earth if we do our jobs. We have to do the work, though. That's what we're here for. Um, I read the Magi story last night, just to familiarize myself a little bit. And it seemed like it was pretty important for them to tell Herod what was going on and them to realize not to go back to Herod because of the slaughter of the innocents. Do you have a sense of that? Was they, because they were wise men? Well, actually. I have over here some things I've just done. Do you okay. want to yes, see that? Yes, let's do that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on the back of these cards, oh, this is during the, this present Iraq war, actually. Mm -hmm. I was so disturbed at the amount of refugees. This is done a couple of years ago, but this is a few years ago. This was over 
two and a half million Iraqis are displaced in their own country. That means they're not in their home. 2.2 million had fled Iraq, mostly to Syria, Jordan, and Iran. And fewer than 3,000 Iraqis had been allowed back in the United States. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture by the Christian peacemakers. And I thought, boy, does that feel like something like a refugee holy family where Joseph takes Mary and Jesus and flees into Egypt because of Herod. So I did this, and then here's another one of them on a, on a truck, these Iraqi refugees. And this is a painting I did 1958, I saw on the thing, that was with our Grailville, our Grail, a Brooklyn, a Bronx Center in New York. And I call that Refugee Madonna. It's sort of, it's, it's an, it was an effort to try to tie this Christmas story through the story of the Magi and the story of the flight into Egypt, which resulted there. And maybe those gifts of the Magi are, you know, are real, that they brought them valuable gifts, and that supported them in their <laughs> exodus and refugee journey. That's great. All right. Um, so I was wondering, what, what actually fired you up at the age of eight to start sculpture? Well, I lived in a, in a regular suburban Cl Cleveland Heights home mm -hmm. with an ordinary front yard, but we dumped out in the back to this, rep, to this ravine behind our house. The bottom of the ravine, there was clay that didn't crack when it dried, like mud puddle clay did. Mud puddle clay just sort of cracked. This was yellow clay, and I dug it, and I made stuff. I just liked doing it. So I started doing it. My mother and father were not the kind who drove you every place. They were not soccer mom. She was not a soccer mom. And were, I was the oldest of four children, and they, they finally said, oh, maybe we should get the girls some lessons. <laughs> that, that was about three or four years. So I ended up going to the Cleveland Art Institute. I actually, at 12, was firing the kiln for Edris Eckhart, in, who did ceramics, taught ceramics at the Cleveland Art Institute. And so that was my life during high school. I won awards, national awards, for my horses sculptures, and, and I started to do things like, like, I tried my first nativities, actually, at, during that time. But then I was really interested in Catholic action when I found out about it, what a lay person could do. And these are the years right after the Second World War. It's 1945 to 49 were my high school years. And we started to hear what was going on in Europe. And I was very inspired by the idea of the priest worker in Germany, French priests who would voluntarily go with the conscripts that were taken to, uh, to Germany to work in factories. Uh, those things inspired me. I wanted to work in a factory. My father didn't think that was a good idea, so I didn't, actually. Uh, but I then was starting to hunt down for a Catholic, where you could be, go deep into the idea that we're part of the mystical body. You don't have to become a priest or a nun. That we are, have, all have a priestly task to help mediate in the world, wherever, wherever we are, and whatever our task is, whether we're a mother, whether, whether, wherever we are, we have, we have this calling. So that's how, that's how I got all inspired. And there's only one place for a girl, and that was Grailville. So I finally went and was challenged while I was here the first days. So would you tell us about uh, these uh, particular sculptures right now? These are the first things we did. I was doing this kind of thing, but it's the first sort of thing I did that expressed, when I was b back into the art world here at Grailville, expressed this idea of Advent, which we saw with the first one that came, the, the big Madonna. This, she is called fiat. That's the Latin for some of those words she said to the angel, let it be done unto me. It's the idea of total surrender, this total surrender that humanity is asked to have before the Creator. The, the source of life. And so this is what Advent meant for me. And then this was another one I had done. She's just a simple image of a woman. Now, she's meant to be all of us, men and women, before God. The, our attitude before God, that's what it is. 
these are also that we have then a responsibility to to give to give the love of God out to the world. That's what these statues of Mary and Jesus are about. It's not that we worship any of these images. They're just helps, meant to be helps. So she's called Adsum. That means to be present. And so that's what my first advent at Grailville meant for me. Lovely. So. Mm -hmm. 